Democrats have announced their new plan to reopen the economy never so that no one will die until everyone is dead and the economy will come back after it ceases to exist, which will be Trump's fault. The $40 quintillion plan will make it impossible for anyone to go to work so that no one will pay taxes and those taxes no one pays will be used to send relief to people who are out of work so they'll be able to pay taxes, which will be used to give them money. Democrats feel their plan will help the campaign of Joe Biden by making Biden's gibbering non sequiturs seem rational in comparison to the plan. Once elected, Biden will be placed in the Oval Office where he'll be watered twice a day so that the birds can nest in his branches. Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi came out from behind her palace walls, stepped over the homeless people lining the sidewalks of her district, strode proudly through the rubble of what was once San Francisco, and held a press conference among the proud and thriving corpses of her constituents, telling a cult of worshipful reporters, quote, only a snarling right-wing doo-doo head would want to go back to work or have a life when people are actually dying in this country of viruses and old age and traffic accidents. Each one of those lives is too infinitely precious for us to be able to make money and eat meals when they are being ruthlessly destroyed by Donald Trump, who I pray for every day, unquote. Pelosi then proposed a $70 vermilion aid package to fall from the sky like silver rain and said anyone who opposed it must not care about poor people. Meanwhile, angry commentators on CNN are demanding a new law that would make it racist to call murder hornets Asian just because they happen to be yellow, have strangely shaped eyes, and are trying to kill us. <laughs> Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Claven, and this is The Andrew Claven Show. Hunky donkey, life is tickety boo. Birds are winging, also singing. Hunky donkey doo. Ship shaped, tipsy topsy. The world is a bitty zing. It's a wonderful day. Hurrah, hooray! It makes me want to sing. Oh, hurrah, hooray! Oh, hooray, hurrah! You know, we got asked on one of the comments if we can start releasing my opening monologues delivered with such professionalism and seriousness uh, as separate videos. And you can find them on the Andrew Claven YouTube channel, my particular YouTube channel, Andrew Claven uh, on YouTube. We will release those openings uh, every day. Uh, we also have a comment. I just also like this. That, that, that question was from Lane Bristow. Uh, we also have a comment on the YouTube channel from Ulf Peter Schutt, which is uh, just a, a, a little song, Save the Claven Day or Night, Save the Claven Fear No Fight, Save the Cl Claven. <laughs> This is true. Save the Claven, me and you. I think that that was a that's a beautiful, beautiful sentiment. Uh, it gets a reaction from cars and cameras. This goal should but be what we are focusing our attention on. Saving the Claven is our generation's World War II, to which Wolf replies, cars and cameras. I think World War II is too small to be compared. To save the Clavin. I'm glad someone is having fun on the show. All right. Uh, one of our key themes uh, this week has been what I call narrative distortion. And I know a lot about narrative distortion because it's a trick that novelists use uh, when we want to guide people on what they feel and see in a story. And what is happening, of course, in our news media is they use it on nonfiction, attempting to align facts to make them express what they want them to instead of what the facts just express. And narrative distortion takes a lot of forms. There's reporting non representative events uh, as if they were representative. I talked about that the other day, the shooting of a black man in Georgia by two white men is interesting story, but it doesn't represent a general problem or issue that needs solving. It's just a crime. And reporting the story at a national level is a holdover technique from the corrupt Obamagate administration, which used these kinds of stories to distract black people from the fact that they were being ignored by the Obamagate administration. So yesterday, we got a particularly egregious form of narrative distortion, which uh, at the hearing uh, where Dr. Fauci was testifying before the Senate, uh, he said, basically what he said was Trump and I work together well and we've created a phased plan to reopen the country and we should follow that plan because we can't wait for a vaccine, which may never come. He also said if we didn't follow the plan, it could cause spikes and setbacks and he was more cautious sounding uh, than Trump. Here's the headline from the New York Times about this, a former newspaper. Health experts at odds with Trump paint grim picture of months ahead. Now, the thing is, Trump has also painted a grim picture, but he just says we have to be brave. We have to be warriors and face this so we can reopen the economy. And Fauci basically is saying the same thing, but he's saying it from the other direction. Another way Fauci's narrative was distorted was by creating the impression that he's the only person on Trump's team who matters, which is even he says is not true. He says, you know, I'm a public health official and he's not, for instance, studying the fact that if schools don't reopen, 
Poor children will fall behind because they don't have parents who can necessarily educate them at home. And working moms can't go back to work because their kids aren't in school. So it's a multifaceted problem, and we have to look at it from many sides, and not just Fauci's. And I, I don't like the fact that Fauci gets hit for this, because I think what he says is basically the truth. The greatest narrative distortion, though, of the greatest narrative distortion of all is silence, not telling the story at all. And that's what we're getting on Obamagate, and that should tell you where the greatest threat to your freedom lies. All right, we got the Wuhan mailbag coming up, uh, which is, of course, spreading wisdom like a plague. And uh, also, you know, a lot of times on right wing, uh, you know, podcasts and places, you, you'll hear this kind of panicky idea that somehow you could get trapped in your home without food readily available and you'd have to worry about food shortages. I know that's a crazy idea, but if that should ever happen, like now, you might want to try ReadyWise because when governor, government resources are strained, it can be days, if not weeks, before fresh food is available. You don't want to put yourself in a situation when you need food during an emi- emergency and you can't get it. Prepare today with ReadyWise food. ReadyWise makes being prepared simple and affordable. You order online. You have nutritious meals shipped directly to your doorstep. When preparing our meals, uh, all you need is four cups of water and the water doesn't have to be hot. You simply pour the food into water, stir and cover. After about 15 minutes, the meal is ready. Some meals can even be prepared directly in in the pouch, eliminating the need for additional supplies. ReadyWise uses the finest ingredients and latest food preparation technology to ensure optimal taste and freshness and can remain fresh for up to 25 years, which LA should open by then. This week, my listeners can get a free shipping, get free shipping at readywise.com when entering Claven at checkout or by calling 855-474-4088. Four. ReadyWise has a 90-day no questions asked return policy, so there's no risk taking the initiative to get yourself and your family prepared today. That's ReadyWise, R-E-A-D-Y-W-I-S-E dot com, promo code Claven to get free shipping. How, how do you spell Claven? Oh, that's uh, they don't tell you that. <laughs> V-A-N. There don't stop no there. <laughs> All right. All right. I, you know... Uh, I'm, I'm feeling tremendously optimistic today, which I, th- I think I'll, I will talk about in just a minute. But the, the thing the thing is, there was news about the Chinese flu yesterday and reopening, and, and that probably should be the lead story. And why do I keep leading with Obamagate? And it is because I feel this is the biggest political scandal. It's beginning to shape up to be the biggest, biggest political scandal of my lifetime. And they are working very hard to make this go down the memory hole. And that should tell you, that should tell you that it is a threat to your freedom more important than what's happening with the flu, which I believe, you know, there there are possible potential threats there down the road and also people who are overreacting now. But the real threat is having this Democrat machine get back into office. If you don't think that the media is trying to cover this up, here is the the premier female journalist uh, in America, Brian Stelter, trying to cover this up and how he covered it before when he thought he had Trump in his sights. Latest on the Robert Mueller Russia investigation. <laughs> Mueller investigation. The Russian investigation. Trump's Russia ties. And Robert Mueller. The real Russia story. Russia probe. The ongoing Russia probe. <laughs> Russia probe. The Russian investigation. But Mueller and the Russia probe. Russia synergies. They wonder if Russia has compromising information on the president. What is the source for the president's claim that they have found no collusion with Russia? He misspelled collusion. Every day we're trying to keep track of the drip, drip, drip of the Russia investigation. <laughs> drip, 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 Trump and Russia to see whether Trump was secretly working for Russia. To bring it back to Russia and Russia and Russia. 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 Robert Mueller. Robert Mueller. Special counsel Robert Mueller. Robert Mueller. Robert Mueller. Robert Mueller. Robert Mueller. Robert Mueller. Mueller investigation. Mueller report. Russia conspiracy. Do you believe that he's colluding with Russia? I wish I could just say no. <laughs> so now, now Brian Stelter is saying we right wingers are uh, obsessed with this. We're obsessed with it. Why are we obsessed with it? This is, should tell you something. This should tell you something. When the media covers stuff up, your freedom is in peril. That's where your freedom is in peril. It's worse than when they're attacking you for trying to reopen your neighborhood and your shop. So why am I feeling optimistic? I woke up this morning, I was feeling really good, and I had to ask myself, uh, you know, what that is, because it's only a feeling. You know, feeling good doesn't really mean anything, uh, and it doesn't have anything to do with what will happen next. And the reason I thought about it is over the past three to five days, I've had a number of conversations with conservative friends. And when you talk to conservatives, you always get the worst possible version of things. 
And why is that? Well, because that's conservatives' natural bent. That's why they're conservatives. They're conservatives because they see how if you pull this string, the stars fall down, right? They can always trace the, the constellation of, to disaster. And we need people to do that. We need people to see where dangers are coming from. And that's part of evolution, obviously. The guy who sees the dangers, the guy who stays alive. However, because I respect my conservative friends, and because many of them are highly intelligent, and I listen to them, I always listen first, and then I go away, and I'm a slow thinker, and I think through their arguments. And I thought through their arguments, and I don't think their arguments hold water, because I don't think, and this is another, this is a conservative flaw, I don't think conservatives really think about the way people actually behave. Um, and what I think right now is that the Democrats are all in on two things, right? They're all in on these lockdowns. We're going to stay locked down forever. And they're all in on covering up for the Democrats. And they're covering up three things. They're covering up Obamagate. They're covering up the fact that uh, this Tara Reid thing with Biden, which may be true or may not be true, but they're covering it up. They're, they're playing it down. And they're covering up the fact that uh, Joe Biden is now a, a houseplant, that he is so deteriorated over the last six months that he is no longer the man he was six months ago. He can barely keep a sentence together. Uh, he, you know, I think 28 percent of Democrats are now uh, saying that he's not going to be the candidate. And that creates large problems for the Democrats. So th this seems to be the, what they're betting on. And yesterday we had two special elections in California. And the big one was that uh, Katie Hill's seat. Remember, she was thrown out in that sex scandal. Uh, it seems to be going red. Now, in both of these cases, California counts large number of mail in votes after Election Day. So they, it is guaranteed they're going to try and overturn this election. It's like, oh, yeah, I found, you know, they'll, they'll go over to the magic castle and be like, oh, yeah, I found these these votes. There are thousands of votes in my pocket. They just keep coming out like a handkerchief. So we're going to see that. But it doesn't matter because we've already seen we see you and we've already seen that. People are not buying into this. And yesterday, L.A. said, oh, yeah, we're going to stay locked down uh, through August. And then suddenly they said it was like they put out this Emily Latella uh, announcement. Never mind. You know, where suddenly they said, yeah, we're going to stay locked down. But while we're locked down, we'll be opening up and we'll have a phase in lockdown that will phase out as we open up and you'll be able to go to work. And basically what it comes down to is if we see a conservative on the street, we'll arrest him. But everybody else is going to be going back to work. And we know this is going to happen because uh, Elon Musk reopened his uh, factory and said, come and arrest me, come and get me, you guys. And they didn't because they know they can't lose Elon Musk and Tesla. And they, he opened it for perf perfectly good business reasons, which is they're opening in Detroit. They're opening the, the other uh, motor companies. So he's got to be able to um, he's got to be able to compete. So th this is their strategy. And, you know, again, I worry about Trump because I worry about the very things that got him elected or, or the very things that could get him unelected, his pugilism and his openness and the fact that he is off he is off point for a lot of things. He was right about China. He was right about immigration. He was right about globalism and all the forces that are arrayed in favor of those things, in favor of globalization, in favor, which means being in favor of China as well, because that's their part of their plan and in favor of open borders, all those people are arrayed against them and they're powerful. They are, they are very powerful. However, listen to the things that are coming out. The House Intelligence Committee released 57 transcripts of interviews it conducted during its investigation into Russia's meddling with the 2016 election. All right. The committee probe started in January 2017 under Devin Nunes then, and it concluded in March 2018 with a report finding no evidence that the Trump campaign conspired with the Kremlin. Uh, and most of the transcripts were ready to release long ago. But Adam Schiff, my congressman, refused to release them after he became chairman. He only released them last week when the White House threatened to do it first. That's why he did it. He's saying, no, 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 I had this and that. It's, it, that's why he did it. All right. Little pencil now, neck Adam Schiff. <laughs> well, let's hear from Adam Schiff in March 2017. This is uh, cut 15. And this is what he said repeatedly. And he said this and more than this. Cut 15. I can't go into the particulars, but there is more than circumstantial evidence now. So, um, again, I think so you Director have Clapper, seen direct evidence of collusion. Uh, I don't want to go into specifics, but I will say that there is evidence that is not circumstantial uh, and uh, and is very much worthy of investigation. So uh, that is what we ought to do. That's so and he went on to say it was proved and all this stuff. None of this was true. Reading now from the Wall Street Journal. In July 2017, former director of national intelligence, James Clapper, told Schiff and his colleagues, and this is under oath, right? I never saw any direct empirical evidence that the Trump campaign or someone in it was plotting, conspiring with the Russians to meddle with the election. 
Three months later, former Obama Attorney General Loretta Lynch agreed that while she'd seen concerning information, quote, I don't recall anything being briefed up to me. Former Deputy AG Sally Yates concurred several weeks later, we are at the fact-gathering stage here, not the conclusion stage. The same goes for the FBI agents who started the collusion probe in 2016. Former FBI Director Andrew McCabe admitted the Bureau's reason for opening the case, which was that stupid uh, steel thing, was nonsense. Here's Adam Schiff yesterday on MSNBC, cut six. The Russians approached the Trump campaign. Uh, they did so in writing. They offered dirt they had on Hillary Clinton as part of what they described as the Russian government effort to help the Trump campaign. Uh, and at the highest levels, the Trump campaign said, yes, we'll take it, we'd love it. Uh, Don Jr. accepted. He set up a secret meeting in Trump Tower to get the dirt. Uh, the president's son-in-law was there. The campaign chairman was there. Um, and what's more, the campaign chairman, uh, in a different uh, uh, vignette, gave uh, internal polling data to someone linked to Russian intelligence. You had other people like Roger Stone uh, in touch with the Russian cutout that was publishing the stolen Hillary Clinton material through WikiLeaks. All of this is abundant evidence of collusion. But this is their attempt to gaslight America and once again saying you can't believe your eyes, you can't believe what's written in the transcripts. Uh, you have to, uh, you know, accept our counter narrative things. But the evidence is there for all to see. So now he's down to one meeting that uh, that Tr Donald Trump Jr. said he probably shouldn't have done, but amounted to nothing. He's talking about Roger Stone, who was lying about talking to a Russian got out. He just was bragging about this stuff. He's talking about nothing. It's kind of like they once read From Russia to Love, the James Bond novel. So they must have been. He's got nothing. And he's still lying. And MSNBC has still got this pencil neck, turtle faced liar talking to them, you know, ha having with his face hanging out, talking to them. And they're and they know they're being lied to now. They know they're being lied to now. They know they're being lied to by a guy who lied and is lying now. And they're just going to go with it. They're going to keep banging that drum. You know, I know there are a lot of people who are going to follow that Pied Piper over the hill, but not all of America and not a lot of independents. I just don't believe it. Now they say um, they want the DOJ has dropped the case against Michael Flynn, this horrible thing where the FBI, I mean, if this happened, somebody pointed out, it was Kyle Smith, I think, who pointed out, if this happened to a black kid and white FBI agents went in there and said, we're not going to tell him he needs a lawyer, and then we're going to get him to lie, you know, make a mistake about something, and even if it's not lying, we're going to call it lying. So they, they dropped their charges, but the federal judge uh, said he would not immediately uh, accept the Justice Department move. And he called uh, U.S. District Judge Emmett Sullivan, said in a very unusual order, he would set a schedule to receive friend of the court briefs, which means people who are completely uninvolved can come in and make statements, and they are not often filed in criminal cases. Uh, Andy McCarthy says uh, this cantank the cantankerous jurist is stoking opposition to the dismissal. He know the law calls for him to accede to Attorney General Bill Barr's decision, but Barr can't stop Sullivan from turning the dismissal into anti-Trump group therapy. So that's what he's doing. That's their plan. This is their plan. Here's here's Eric Holder still defending, uh, you know, putting the trying to turn the attack around. Let's cut seven. What we have is a president who is bound and determined to delegitimize those parts of the government that he thinks pose the greatest threat to him. That is the Justice Department, the FBI, the intelligence community as well. Uh, he say, says those kinds of things that you just sh showed from uh, from the Rose Garden. It's all part of a plan uh, to somehow make those institutions weaker so that he can do the kinds of in illicit, implicit, illicit things um, that he has been uh, he's been doing. And he's facilitated by this attorney general. Uh, this attorney general is actually complicit in this by weakening these institutions. This is an attorney general who's supposed to stand up for the people who work for him. And in fact, he is doing all that he can to weaken the very institutions that uh, that he leads. You're lying. <laughs> so we're gonna, we, we, we corrupted these institutions by ferreting out that corruption. You're weakening the institutions. Uh, you're obsessed over this because we were obsessed over it. I just don't think this is going to work. I do not think they can get away with this. Let's see. 
Um, but also let us talk about Bambi when you're running a business HR issues. This is a big deal and it remains a big deal even if you're running your business from home and I know a lot of businesses are struggling and readjusting. Still, HR is huge. Wrongful termination suits, minimum wage requirements, labor regulations, and some of these rules are completely irrational. HR managers aren't cheap, an average of $70,000 a year, but Bambi can fix this for you. B-A-M-B-E-E -E was created specifically for small businesses for $99 a month. You can get a dedicated HR manager who will craft HR policy and maintain your compliance. With Bambi, you can change HR from your biggest liability to your biggest strength. Your dedicated HR manager is available by phone, email, or real-time chat. From on onboarding to terminations, they customize your policies to fit your your business all for just $99 a month. Go to Bambi.com slash Clavin right now to schedule your free HR audit. That's Bambi.com slash Clavin spelled B-A-M to the B, <laughs> Bam to the B, B, oh my gosh, I cannot spell Bambi. It's Bam to the B, E, E, and put in dot com slash Clavin, which is Clay to the V. <laughs> but but I make it Come look on. easy, don't I? <laughs> Come on, man. All right, maybe I don't look as make it look as easy as I thought. All right, uh, so let's let's be fair. We're going to talk about the virus. This is their second thing that they're going to do. So let's take a look at the Democrat plan. Joe Biden, the presumptive nominee for president, uh, is frustrated by all this talk of just opening up the economy. Here he is, cut 10. I reject the premise that somehow this is hurting us. There's no evidence of that. I'm following the rules following the rules the president should follow the rules instead of showing up at places without masks and the whole the whole thing look this is I'm, I'm getting really frustrated with not you with this the whole notion that somehow there is we can just open we can move i trust my life to that man i trust my life to that man as long as he is nowhere near an open door as long as he's still in the basement i think I think we're all safe. And, and the, you know, he's being very brave because, as he points out, this, this Chinese flu, not many people know this, this Chinese flu only attacks Democrats. This is cut four. Look, the people who are getting hurt are, are Democrats, hardworking people, the people who can't afford to stay home, the people who are getting clobbered, the people who are making an hourly wage, the people who are out there saving our lives, carrying the country on their back and losing lives in the process of doing it. They're the people who are in trouble. A lot of millionaires aren't in trouble. People making tens of millions of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars, they're not in trouble. What's the people who are in trouble are the very people that are our constituency. You know, those people haven't been their constituency for quite some time, but that's all right. <laughs> Joe's living in the past. But luckily, luckily, look, I make fun of him because he's a houseplant, but but luckily he did appoint uh, Alexandria Occasional Cortex uh, to be on his uh, climate change panel. Uh, so that's good because she is a real expert. <laughs> she, she is the voices in my head. She is uh, an expert in ranting uh, nonsensically about the fact that the country is going to end in 12 years. Um, you know, so and 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 so they're sti so far they're sticking with this guy. But just remember, this is all one thing that they are going to cover up the fact that he can't you know, speak anymore. They're going to not, they're going to try not to look at it until finally they have to, because it's getting worse, uh, even as we watch. And they're going to cover up any sexual allegations. Here is Chuck Schumer. Here's Chuck Schumer selling his soul in real time to back uh, Joe Biden and saying the Me Too movement is still alive and well, eh, just not, not for us. Before um, uh, the Me Too movement, women were not listened to who um, uh, were telling what had happened to them. Since Me Too, women are listened to. Now, I've heard Joe Biden's uh, explanation. I think it's sufficient. I think he will be a great candidate. I think he will be a great president. And I think he'll take us ta take, help us take back the Senate. <laughs> Even he can't say it with a straight face. It's great. It's like, yeah, we before Me Too, women weren't listened to. Uh, now we listen to them and then ignore them. I, you know, I mean, it's just, and and again, I always thought believe all women was one of the stupidest things ever, since women represent half of the world's liars. Uh, I, I don't know who the other half are, but I'll just take a wild guess and say it's men. But but 
it, now the, the standards totally changed. Everything's gone. So they're selling their soul in real time. They're covering up in real time. We're watching this happen. It's not like we can't see it. And, you know, I, there are things, there are, Areas I worry about, I worry about old people who still think uh, those nice people on the network news are telling them the news. I worry about them because they're a big Trump constituency uh, and maybe they've bought into this narrative. And the narrative is that Trump is just recklessly trying to reopen. They use this with uh, Fauci yesterday. They kept saying, you know, that Fauci, I read you the New York Times headline, oh, Fauci and Trump are at odds. Here's what Fauci had to say about this. This is cut eight. There is certainly not a confrontational relationship between me and the president. Uh, as I've mentioned many times, I give uh, advice and opinion based on evidence-based scientific information. Uh, he hears that. Uh, he respects it. He gets opinions from a variety of other people. But in no way, in my experience over the last several months, has there been any confrontational relationship between us. So, so that, that kind of just explodes the entire narrative. I mean, what is the narrative? You know, Trump has said there could be spikes as we go back. He said it's a tragedy. He said he loves the people who have been sick and ill, and he, he feels their pain. He understands. Remember when uh, Bill Clinton used to feel people's pain? He'd bite his lower lip because if he were fighting back tears because he felt your pain. Trump says that, but it doesn't register. Like, it's just, it's just whenever he says things that are compassionate, whenever he says things that are inspiring, whenever he says things that are true, which is most of the time, uh, they just get, are ignored. And, you know, it is it is funny. Trump does say things. He does exaggerate sometimes. Uh, he does do that kind of carnival barker things where he says this is the greatest this ever and I'm the greatest president ever. He does all that stuff. And sometimes he even gets his facts uh, wrong. It, it is absolutely true. But he has been right about an awful lot of things. And I am just concerned. I mean, I know I keep saying this, but it's important. I'm concerned that conservatives in fighting the fights they have to fight, where which is if in your neighborhood you're getting locked down when you shouldn't be and if they're violating your rights. I hope we'll talk about this uh, some more tomorrow. Uh, uh, about some of these, you know, over the top lockdown orders and how we have to fight them. But but still, you know, you're fighting that fight, but you have to be defending this guy because I think ultimately he's doing the right thing. He is operating through federalism, as I keep saying, which, you know, sometimes I think right wingers don't want what they say they want. I mean, federalism is what we keep claiming about states' rights, and we keep talking about that. And suddenly, you know, where, why, where's Trump's leadership? Why isn't he taking charge? Well, he's not taking charge because the states have to operate in the states. And look, and that is going to help. Another reason I'm optimistic is I think people are going to see. They're going to see the difference between Texas and California. They're going to see the difference between Georgia and California. And, and they think, oh, there's going to be this great, you know, spike in, um, in numbers, and they're going to sell that with all their hearts. But I'm not convinced that that's going to happen. You know, during the Obama administration, the only place where the economy was coming back was in Texas. And they sold that as a good economy for the country. But it was because Texas was operating under red principles. The other thing, too, is that Trump is ignoring Fauci's advice and he's just pushing for reopening. And, and Kaylee uh, McEnany, uh, the new press secretary, who's just doing a great job, fielded a question about this. It's cut three. Does President Trump still believe in these federal guidelines? And if so, why isn't he urging states to follow them instead of asking them to move quickly to reopen? Well, he has encouraged states to follow the guidelines. That's still consistently our recommendation today that you should follow the phased approach to reopening as outlined in the data. Um, I do want to stress, as the president has stressed, that we do want to reopen this country because there are consequences that run the other way when we stay closed down as a country. And I want to run through a few of those with you. Um, a hotline run by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services saw a 1,000 percent increase in responses during April as we kept this country closed. Epic Stata said um, appointments for screening for cancer of the cervix, colon, and breast were down 86 percent and 94 percent in March. There are real consequences for that. You know, I mean, this is, you know, she's making this simple argument that people will also die from a, from a shutdown economy. But the argument is much more complicated than that, too. A, a bad economy is bad for everybody. It's not just the deaths. I know that death is a good statistic because everybody can understand death. It's bad. But that's not the only statistic. You know, there's, there's also losing your meaning and purpose in life. There's also losing the businesses you built, your dreams. You know, these are all things that are happening during this lockdown that probably, look, probably next time this happens, next time there's a, a, a pandemic, like this, we probably won't do this. It probably won't behave. We probably won't behave in the same way. And, you know, but we didn't know that at the time. I'm not blaming anybody for that, because like I said, everybody made the same decision. But the time has come to open up in the phased way, as always, always, of course, 
save the Claven first. I mean, that's the. I, I don't even know why they don't just have that as part of their, you know, uh, advertising at the at the White House. But but obviously, with saving the Claven, with protecting vulnerable people, all of that. This is just what has to be. There's so much noise. There's so much noise on the right and left. This is just, it's going to happen. The things are going to open up and it doesn't matter because people will not stand it after a while and people will not live in fear forever. And that's why I'm, I'm just kind of optimistic. I don't feel the threats that people see are the real threats. I feel the real threat is the kind of corruption that Obama was uh, perpetrating on the American people. All right. Let us talk. You know, I really like our sponsors. I got to say, Jared does a really good job bringing in people that we can trust and like, and they stick with us in times of trouble. And I hope you stick with them. The Benham brothers whom I've met are just terrific guys. And look, this is the time when you have to manage your business. You have to manage your workforce and your workflow really well. And systems are crucial right now. And the Benham brothers are great at this. These guys have over a dozen businesses, including a real estate empire that spans over 35 states. The Benham brothers launched a new podcast called Expert Ownership. And in this podcast, the Benham Brothers interview leaders from all walks of life to help you navigate your business through these challenging times. You'll hear from Senator Ted Cruz and Al Robertson from Duck Dynasty and many more. So go check out this new podcast called Expert Ownership and be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts and wherever you listen. We'll drop a link to their podcast uh, in our show description. That's Expert Ownership. Go check it out. Uh, the uh, yeah, <laughs> go, check, go check it out. It, it really They're really great guys, and they really have a lot to say about this. They have stood up for conservative principles again and again, and it's cost them. Uh, and so you want to see how you can run a business without destroying your life. Also, again, I'm telling you, this is a threat. This is a direct threat for each one of you personally. Go and get an all-access membership, 10% off with the coupon code coupon code Clavin. I'm so, I'm so optimistic that I just can't speak anymore. Go to dailywire.com slash subscribe and put in coupon code Clavin. It's not for the 10% off that you get. It is so that Knowles does not get more subscriptions in his name than me. If that happens, there will be hell to pay. I'm telling you, the virus is nothing. The shutdown is nothing. A worldwide depression will be nothing compared to the hell that I will unleash if Knowles gets more subscriptions than I. And you know what you get with all access. You get all the good benefits of being a member. Plus, you get the Leftist Tears Tumblr, which is, look, this thing alone is worth hundreds of thousands of dollars in your dreams. And so <laughs> I think you want to get this and you get to be on the mailbag, which is coming right up. Yeah. All right, mailbag. <laughs> After the operation, <laughs> she, she's changed so very much, but now she's who she really is. Uh, from Christy, thank you for taking my question. I wanted to ask you this because Knowles is sometimes too pro-Trump and Ben is sometimes too anti-Trump, and you seem to be right in the middle of them. Who should take the blame for the crash of the American economy, President Trump or the individual state governors? Well, I actually don't think uh, that, that the blame, the blame is coming now, right? When Trump started out, he gave the advice we should take two weeks to flatten the curve. I, I can't tell you, I don't think anybody can tell you actually whether that was the right thing to do or not. There are a lot of people arguing that we never should have done it. We just should have saved the Clavin. They really, they just saying we should just should have put Clavin in a room by himself and that would have done, and then let everybody else go out there uh, because that that's the only thing that really matters. And no, and maybe a couple of other older people, uh, they should have protected. And so there are people saying that maybe that's what we'll do next time. But I, I have a lot of patience for this uh, because I know that acting in the dark with a new threat that nobody knew what was going to happen, you know, maybe people panicked, but maybe panic was the, the natural universal reaction. So I have a patience for that. I think it's now, it's now that we start to see who's to blame. And now if, if people, if the states do not open up, if Places like Wisconsin act as if they're New York, you know, which is absurd. I mean, the, the density of population is just so different. And if people, I think it was in Wisconsin the other day where they sent like 20 police cars to shut down a bar, you know, if that sort of thing starts happening, that's when you start to put blame out for not letting the economy rebound. And we know these Democrats, they do not understand where money comes from. They think it just falls from the sky. They think the state, they think that your money, the money they let you keep from your taxes is money they let you keep. They don't understand it's your money and they're taking it away. Nancy Pelosi does not understand that her 
six-figure paycheck comes from you. It's not your paycheck that comes from her. We can do perfectly well without them. We can do perfectly well. We could do well without a government. I mean, obviously, that's not what you want. You do need a government to keep people from killing one another. But if we had to have no government, we could have no government. They can exist without us. If we shut down, they're gone. So the people to blame are the people now. It's This is the time. This is the time when you start to see how people behave. And I think uh, Trump did what he had to do. I think he, like I said, he did what everybody else did. So I think that uh, if we find out later that this was not the best idea, then hopefully next time we know better. But, you know, it was first time pandemic. We didn't see it coming. Uh, even with the warnings, you just never see these things coming. So I think this, it's, it's paying attention now to what's happening that you'll know uh, whether to apportion, whether whether to apportion blame and to whom to apportion blame. Um, from Michelle, save the Clavin. I have been living in the Republic of Ireland for 20 years now, and our lockdown is not going to lift anytime soon. That's Trump's fault too. This is the thing. They act like the Democrats act like this is not going on all over the world. Uh, my problem is, as farmers, my family is doing fine. My off-farm job, also in agriculture, has expanded. I'm doing great. Our daughter is doing fine with remote learning. How do I deal with the guilt I feel that I don't care if the lockdown doesn't end for a long while? So you move to Ireland and you develop Catholic guilt. Uh, people all around us are horribly affected and we are great and even better off because of the lockdown. I don't want to feel so good as the situation in this country goes downhill. As I drive along on my way to work, I'm smiling at our good fortune only for my heart to crash down thinking of others less fortunate. What do I do to rectify this? Thank you for such a wonderful show. Well, thank you. Um, uh, Michelle, uh, I think you're get, you're thinking about this wrong. I really do. Um, no one has told any story but his own, C.S. Lewis said, famously said. And your story is that things are going well, and that's a blessing, and that's a blessing uh, from God, and you should be grateful to God. It is ungrateful for you to waste your blessings feeling uh, guilty about something that is that you, that your guilt has no effect on. Your guilt has no effect on anybody else, right? Your, your feeling bad is not making anybody else feel good. The good time, there will be good times in your life and there will be bad times. Bad times are guaranteed. You hope you get the good times, right? When you have the good times, it is the grateful thing to do to God to enjoy them. He, he loves to see his people happy. You should be happy in God's sunshine and you should feel really good about what's happening in your family's life. Obviously, obviously, whatever you can do to help those who are suffering, you should do. Whenever you can do to uh, give to charity or, you know, make sure that the people who have, have food, who wouldn't have food, you know, those are wonderful things that you can and should do. Your, your guilt is not helping anybody. Your tears don't feed anybody. You know, that that is not the way. There's nothing that can't be done that can't be done in joy. There's nothing good that can't be done that can't be done in joy. You owe God the enjoyment of your good times. You owe him that in gratitude. You owe him prayers of gratitude and thanks. And God love you. I'm glad things are going well for you. And of course, you know, you owe to your brother and sister man, you know, some some charity and compassion and care. Uh, and that, that uh, enjoyment, uh, of your own life should not be cold enjoyment. Well, I'm doing well, so screw you. Obviously, that's not the answer. It's it's that, it, thank God, I'm doing so well. How can I help those who aren't doing well? And that's, you know, that that's the way we have to live. You, you only have this life on earth uh, to live on earth. And so uh, you are uh, commanded to rejoice. Uh, you are commanded to rejoice evermore. And in your good times, you should rejoice as much as you can. Um, from Matthew, uh, as someone who has had their own struggles with faith and believing, I felt this was a good question for you. I'm Jewish and my wife is Christian. Uh, we're both firm believers in God and she is a firm believer in Jesus. My wife has struggled with a variety of health issues um, and some are things that need constant monitoring as new he health issues continue to arise, especially as it begins to uh, involve our eight-week-old daughter and I continually watch my wife struggle. I find myself questioning my faith at times. Why does God's plan for some people seem to make that struggle more? I am blessed and grateful things are not as bad as other people have it, but it still leaves me to wonder at times. Any insight from you would be gratefully appreciated. Yeah, um, obviously this is the question that uh, troubles the hearts of all people, of all believers. Uh, you know, why do we suffer in a world with a God who loves us? Um, but you, I think you have to look at it from the other way. I think you have to start with suffering. This is a world of suffering. As that lady from Ireland, Michelle, just said, you know, just because you, things are going well for you, they're going badly for someone else, right? They are always going badly for someone else. And in this case, you are the someone else. Things are going badly for you. You have to believe in a God of that world. And obviously, we don't believe in a capricious God. We don't believe in a God who is punishing people, you know, by things. We believe in a God who wants, uh, who has left the universe free and who has found the universe broken.
and whether no matter how you believe that human beings are sinful and at odds with God, it is obviously obvious that they are. It is obvious that everyone, every single person, there's not a single person on earth who is the person he thinks he should be. Not one person on earth thinks, yes, I am perfect. I am the person God made me to be. Every single person. And people who do say that are lying. They're lying to themselves or they're lying to you. Every single person knows that he is not what he should be. And that's why I make the joke all the time, it'll change your life, but will it change it for the better? Because if you say to somebody, this will change your life, you mean that positive because positively because everybody knows his life's are changed. So the world is a broken place. We are are broken. Suffering happens. It happens at random. It happens, you know, it it is part of, there is a larger plan that we can't see in which all that suffering is taken into account. But we have, that's what we have to believe in. That's why the resurrection, I think, is so important, uh, at least a belief in an afterlife, because we have to believe that God's morality is better than ours. And therefore, we can see that life is unfair. We can see that things go badly for good people. Therefore, there must be a greater logic that he sees that we don't see. And that includes a life beyond this life. So so look, you have to believe, as I wrote in the novel True Crime, you have to believe in a God of the sad world. You cannot believe in a God who makes things go well uh, for some people because he likes them and badly for other people because he dislikes them, because that just isn't in keeping with the facts. And when hap- what happens if you have that faith, you know, that I hate to blame him, but it's like Joel Osteen, you know, things should be going well for you because God loves you. When you have that faith and things go badly, you lose your faith. You have to start with a faith in a God of this world. You have to understand this world is broken. You have to understand this world does not work the way God wants it to work, that he suffers with us, that he has suffered with us, he has even suffered unto death with us, and that he knows what's going on, and he's got it covered, but he's got it covered on a plan that is beyond our individual lives. And like, if you can't, if you can't find your way to that, it's very hard to have faith because, um, because things are, do, bad things do happen, and they do happen randomly, and it's very, very tough. And believe me, you know, this is, I, I have myself have suffered tragedy during this lockdown, and it's very, very hard uh, to keep your heart up in in those times. Tragedy is uh, an absolute. It is an absolute. It's like being in a brick box and you have to keep walking with your eye on God. And God will, if you, if you keep walking through hard times with your eye on God, you will get back to the place you need to be at because he will lead you there. And that is one of the things about faith uh, that is so beautiful is that even though it's hard to maintain it in times of tragedy, if you maintain it, you will find your faith strengthened and your love of life deepened and your understanding of life deepened even in tragedy. And that I've had, I've had this experience. I'm not talking, you know, theoretically, this is true. Um, from Philip, uh, you are my favorite host on Daily Wire. Shows excellent taste. I love what you do, and I've been enjoying listening to Another Kingdom. Uh, recently, I started dating a really cool girl. She is a person of color and a very strong conservative capitalist and entrepreneur. Uh, she wants to start a business that hires and helps women of color to succeed as entrepreneurs. Uh, and she says she specifically wants to hire people of color, women of color. Um, I'm a white guy and I've experienced quite a bit of bigotry in college due to the fact that I'm a white conservative and I'm also afraid that I won't be able to get a job because of my skin color and gender. He says, I'm not sure how to reconcile these things. I like that she has a heart for people like herself, but that's also adversely hurting people like me. What do you think I should do? What's your perspective on this topic? Uh, well, my perspective on this topic is that racialism of all kinds is is wrong. It's just, it's just wrong. R- race is not a moral uh It's not a moral quantity of human being, right? There's no moral good to a race, right? Races are what they are. They may be different. Some may have talents that others don't have. I don't know. I have no idea. I don't care. I only know that they were made in God's image, and that's how I have to treat them. So I believe that all racialism is wrong. Good, you know, positive racialism, I'm going to hire more black people. And negative racialism, I'll never hire black people. I believe it's all wrong. Get rid of it all, and the world will be a better place instantaneously. It will become a better place instantaneously. So I disagree with your girlfriend. That's how I feel about it. She feels differently. She has a heart for her people. We all have a heart for her people. You know, by the way, I, I have a heart for my people. I, you know, I will feel uh, good things when someone like me does something uh, that's, that's positive. We all have that. I don't do race. In the, even though I have normal tribal feelings like everybody, I don't do race in the same way I don't do adultery, even though I have normal adulterous feelings like everybody. I, I don't know how it is for women, but men should live by their lights. They shouldn't live by their instincts. They should live by their lights. Okay, so that's that's me. So you guys have a difference of opinion, and it's a difference of outlook, and it's a difference of values, and you need to talk about that. But how do you need to talk about it? You don't talk about it with an, an, uh, an eye toward convincing 
her. You don't talk about it like, ah, I'm going to change your mind or else we can't stay together. You say you, you introduce it as a topic by saying something like, listen, here is something that I need to talk to you about because of my feelings about this. And I, I love the fact that you're a, a conservative entrepreneur. And I love the fact that you have a heart for people like yourself. I understand that entirely. And women of color uh, do have a hard time in the workplace. And, and she's right about that. They do have a hard time uh, in the workplace. And so you, you like that and you sympathize with it. But you have these feelings. You have other feelings, and so those feelings are in conflict, uh, and you'd like to know how she feels about that, and you'd like to hear her side of it, and you're not trying to change her mind, but you want to hear that side of it. In that conversation, you will find out whether, and in conversations like that, you'll find out whether this is a, a any kind of a deal breaker, whether you can't uh, live together with different values. I mean, you should be able to live together with different values, even though I believe uh, men should take a leadership role in their homes. I do not believe that a leadership role means crushing the life and uh, perspective of the people you're leading. It means leading them to joy. It means leading them to fulfillment and joy. That's what leadership is. And so, uh, and so I don't think you should be out to convince her. I don't think you should be out to change her mind. But I do think you should share your feelings and listen to her feelings and listen to her logic and let her listen to your logic uh, without arguing. No arguing. Don't argue. Just discuss. And in that discussion, you know, you'll learn about how, you know, not only will you learn how, if, if you can, reconcile living together with your different values, but you'll learn how to reconcile with each other living with your different values because conversation is at the heart of marriage and you need to be able to know how to do it without making it a struggle and without making it an urge to convince somebody and crush them and change their minds. Uh, all right, I got time for one more. Um, uh, I'm out of time. All right. My uh, my uh, producer is telling me I am out of time. So I'm out of time. But I'll be back again tomorrow with more time. Uh, I'm Andrew Clavin. This is The Andrew Clavin Show. The Andrew Clavin Show is produced by Robert Sterling and directed by Mike Joyner. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Technical producer, Austin Stevens. And our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. Assistant director, Pavel Wydowski. Edited by Adam Saevitz. Audio mixed by Robin Fenderson. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Alvera. Animations are by Cynthia Angulo. Production assistants, McKenna Waters and Ryan Love. The Andrew Clavin Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2020. If you prefer facts over feelings, aren't offended by the brutal truth, and you can still laugh at the insanity filling our national news cycle, well, tune in to The Ben Shapiro Show. We'll get a whole lot of that and much more. See you there. 